God, as we uh, continue a series uh, against all odds, looking at resurrections, um, Father, I, I thank you that there is joy in this room. Lord, I thank you for, um, Lord, <laughs> uh, we can joke, but the miracle of people being here lively with an hour time change. Um, Father, and yet, Father, the seriousness of things that come into this room that need you and um, Father, to acknowledge, uh, I think it was that second song had a, a line around, Lord, where else can we go? Um, Father, there are marriages in this room that feel dead. Would you bring resurrection? Father, there are um, men and women that feel like the prospect of marriage is a dead prospect. Would you bring resurrection, Father? Lord, there are those in this room that um, have issues with kids or, or to have kids, and um, it feels like the situation might be dead. Would you bring resurrection, Father? Lord, there are people in this room with dead-end jobs. Would you bring resurrection, Father? And so, Father, as we gear up in a series uh, to, to celebrate the, your resurrection from the grave, um, Father, we, your people, also acknowledge, Lord, that there are dead ends in our lives, that we have no other place to turn, not inwardly or outwardly, but, but to you, Father, to do what only you can do. And Father, we pray this prayer. I pray this prayer for our people, for your people, not presuming your will. Lord Jesus, you might say yes, you might say no, you might bring the miracle, you might not bring the miracle, and so Father, your will be done, but would you give us confidence and joy in the movement of yourself in our lives? We love you, Jesus, in your name, amen. amen. November 20th, I, uh, I said to Graham, hey, uh, I'm going to be meeting up with some family after church, uh, and so uh, no matter what goes on after church, uh, I will not be part of it. Uh, I am going to go meet up with my family. Uh, the church could burn down, and I am still uh, going to go meet up with my family. And, uh, and so here's why, though. I had my brother who had uh, his uh, his daughter passed away at 14 months old, I believe, uh, at the beginning of 2021. And uh, last November, I got to hold uh, his child, uh, Caleb, uh, in uh, my arms in Cherry Hill. And uh, they had, uh, uh, Charlotte had passed away from uh, a disease that was kind of like a one in a million type thing of getting. And uh, so they had to go through IBF uh, to have uh, another child. And uh, as a family and individually prayed and fasted for days uh, for this child. And so we were sitting there, uh, was it Turning Point? Was it a Turning Point? I don't know, some breakfast place. And uh, having lunch though, and I just held this child and uh, literally fought back tears saying, I am holding a miracle. Uh, to, my, to my kids that were at, at that lunch, it was just lunch with family. Uh, to maybe other people in the restaurant, it was just family getting together. But for me, I saw it as I was holding a miracle. Why is it that sometimes like, we experience a miracle and some of us see it as a miracle and, and some of us don't? And for those that see a situation as a miracle, what, how do we respond? How should we act? What should be sparked up inside of us? When, when something unexplainable is going on in our midst, some of us will, will try to get intellectual with a miracle and try to find logic. But, but miracles, to be a miracle, don't they defy logic? They have to defy logic. Otherwise, it's, it's not necessarily a miracle. And so we can go to that place where we're trying to intellectualize it and, and try to rationalize God out of the equation, or we'll go to a place where there is a miracle, and we'll still go to a place where there's doubt that it was God behind it, and we'll try to say, well, is this, that, the other thing, and not give God credit and glory for what is going on. So what should we do when there is a miracle in our midst, when the unexplainable is in our midst? Do we go to a place where we're entitled to a miracle? God, you owe me this one? That's not worship. Do we go to a place where we would say, I'm responsible for the miracle. I did this. I made it happen. That's not worship. To reason away, the, the miracle is not worship either. 
To humble and complain against the miracle is not worship. What you and I need to do when, we're, when we are experiencing a miracle in our midst is to go to the one who makes miracles happen, the Lord Jesus Christ, and give him all worship, honor, and glory. So that's what I want us to consider today as we jump into 2 Kings chapter 4. Last week, we looked at this dude named Elijah, and now we're going to look at his protege named Elisha. Uh, and so if that confuses you, I don't know why Jesus, uh, in his infinite wisdom, uh, named two people, one after the other, Elijah and Elisha, because uh, pastors for the rest of eternity were getting that confused. Uh, and so, uh, yes, they're in the Bible, and uh, yes, uh, you should go through Bible basics uh, and learn more about this, but I digress. Second Kings chapter 4, we're jumping into the middle of the chapter, so let me explain a little bit. It has a lot of correlations to what we looked at last week. There is, uh, there is Elisha who's traveling uh, back and forth uh, with his servant. He is a man of God, and this rich family takes notice that he's traveling back and forth, and so they build an addition to their house for this man of God, Elisha, and his servant. This unreasonable hospitality for the man of God and, and complete act of kindness. Elisha sees the act of kindness, and one day with his servant, and the woman of the house says, yo, like, what do you have going on in your life? Like, how could I, in essence, repay your kindness? And in that conversation, the, the, woman, uh, the woman of the house is like, well, I don't have kids. My husband is old as dirt, not exactly her words, but kind of her words. And uh, Elisha's like, this time, next year, you will have a child. And she's like, don't you be playing me. And he's like, I ain't playing you. It's going to happen. And it did. Later, later that year, later the next year, that, that time next year, she's holding a child in her, in her arms. It was a miracle. Elijah heard from God, and God, through Elisha, gave this miracle to this woman. And so now the scene goes on as the child grows up. He's in the field. He gets a headache. And like a good husband, the, the father in the field says, go see your mother. Uh, and so he goes to the mother and unfortunately dies in the mother's arms. And so the woman of God gets all frantic. The woman of the house and says, we're going to go see the man of God. The husband's like, that's foolish. Why would you do that? What's done is done. And like, that seems like, don't bother him. He doesn't, he doesn't have, he doesn't really share. You don't see the same faith in the husband as, as, the, as the woman of the house has. And, and she's like all sorts of a rebel. And is like, I'm going and no one's going to stop me. And she goes. And just a note to the spouses in this room that are, are married to a, maybe a, an unbelieving spouse or a spouse that doesn't share your same faith, stay faithful. <laughs> stay faithful. What you do as, a, as the person of God in your house is going to seem foolish to the people in your house that are, don't have that same faith. Stay faithful. <laughs> And, and God, will, God will see your faithfulness and God willing the people around you will see your faithfulness. You stay faithful. This woman lives with resolve and leaves to go and to see this man of God and God meets her in faithfulness. And here's where we're gonna pick up the text. Second Kings chapter four, four uh, verse 25. He says this, when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehaziah, uh, his servant, Look, uh, there, is a there is a Shumanite. Uh, run at once to meet her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, catch this. Having the child just, just earlier die in her arms. What does she say? It is well, all is well. And when she came to the mountain to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet and Gehiza came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone for she is in bitter distress. And catch this very important thing. For the Lord has hidden it from me and has, has not told me. Then she said to him, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Don't play me. And, and he said to, to, Gehaz, uh, to Gehaz, whatever, uh, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. The staff, uh, Elisha had used that to, to do a whole lot of miraculous things. And so the, God had used that staff as a way to uh, induce other miracles. And so it is an act 
of kindness. Take your garment in my hand and go. And if you meet anyone, do not greet him. Uh, if anyone greets you, do not reply. Lay my staff. Go at once on the child's face. And then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And so he arose and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid his staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound uh, or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him the child has not awakened. The child died in her arms and she travels 15 miles to, to Mount Carmel. And this is in a day and age where 15 miles isn't like something that you can just hop in the car and get to and do something about. Like there was, there was work to travel those 15 miles. She's upset. She's mystified. But let's commend her for a second to go to the man of God. To not run from God, but to run, uh, and to the best way she knows, is running to God. And yet at the same time, much like we saw last week, there are emotions that are overtaking uh, this scene as you and I would have emotions if we were lit walking in these sandals. <laughs> And so in these emotions, she gives a false assumption. Is this you? Did you deceive me? Were you, were you playing me? And Elijah ultimately, through the confusion and through the hurt, doesn't presume to know the will of God. Doesn't presume to say, I know what's going on here. He's, he's willing to say, I understand her bitterness I understand her hurt. I sense that. I see that. But God has not made clear to me why this is going on. And so he sends a staff as a way to show some empathy, as a way to start doing something about it. But she stays behind, clinging to his feet. And what we're going to see as to the why is that she wants actual personal attention. The staff proves not to be good enough. And so, hey, you tried your best way to step into this. You got any other things that you can do more than just send somebody else or something else to take care of the situation? Elisha, this might be a situation that you need to show up to. It was, I think, like 2011 or so. I had a, a youth trip uh, to South Dakota. We were going to do a, a missions trip uh, to a, uh, an Indian reservation. And, uh, and so we went out there with like 20 some odd youth. Uh, we were taking our bus to New York City, catching a train to save a little money instead of planes. Uh, we were going to be on a train for two days uh, and then uh, do a mission trip and then, and then come back. All, all good until the bus from Barnegat that we took uh, broke down uh, around Forked River at three in the morning. Uh, and so there we were with a bunch of students that had paid uh, $2,000 or somewhere around maybe $1,500 uh, to do this missions trip. And I was like, we ain't going to make it and we don't have the margin. And so we had to like literally limp into a bus station in Tom's River, catch a bus to New York. Uh, and uh, then we get to Amtrak and we like, it's like so many situations where we just made it, just made it, just made it get on the train, and then it was like, hurry up and wait for two days. Uh, and then we get to Minnesota where we were renting cars to go and, you know, to, to South Dakota and whatnot. And uh, when we got to Minnesota, Amtrak was like, hey, BT Dubs, uh, we lost one of your bags and we don't have a clue where it is. And so we're sorry. <laughs> and Sue Langworthy was on the trip with me. <laughs> And we sorry, don't cut it. <laughs> they, happened, uh, they happened to lose the bag of a, of a girl that was, uh, came from a poorer family. She was handicapped. And it was, if it was like one of those situations where you like, lose anybody's bag uh, but hers. And so Sue Lang was like, hey, the Mall of America is around the corner, right? Yeah, we're going. <laughs> okay, you don't tell Sue Langworthy no. Uh, and so we all went to the Mall of America and, and, and Sue Langworthy started going into like store after store and coming out with bags and bags and bags for this girl that needed to get all of her stuff replaced. And I'm like, Sue, like you're going into like Victoria's Secret. You're going into like some of these places. And I'm like, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And uh, at one point I had to be like, Sue, the youth budget cannot afford to pay for this. What are you doing? And she's like, the youth budget isn't going to pay for this. Amtrak's going to pay for this. And I was like, did Amtrak tell you that they're going to pay for this? And she's like, no, but they're going to. 
And they did. I still, to this day, do not know how she got Amtrak to pay $1,100 worth of clothing. But Sue Langworthy did. That's empathy, isn't it? Empathy is feeling the need, feeling the situation, and not just saying, I feel so sorry for you, but actually doing something about it. So here is a situation that would demand empathy from humanity that surrounds this woman. And so just two things when it comes to empathy that I want to stress to you from this situation. As many of us walk into a room like this in need of a miracle, surrounded by people that could speak empathy or uh, practice empathy into the situation. Two things. First, please do not speak foolishly of God. We know when there are situations that demand the work of God, a loved one dies or there is a need in a life that, that brings tears and needs and whatnot, we want to start speaking, 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 speaking. And we can fill people with hope. God told, told me you're going to have a kid. God told me your marriage is going to be restored. God told me you're going to get that house. Have faith and it will happen. But if God did not literally speak to you, you are presuming an authority that is not yours. And it destroys faith in people that think that, they, that you are speaking on behalf of God. And then they don't come at you. They come at God. And so in those situations, the, the best thing that you can do is pray for people and speak honestly to people. Pray, thy will be done, but please do not lie to people and say things that are, or go against the word of God or speak on behalf, of the, or, or on behalf of God unless God has really given you that word. The second thing is something that should be obviously, but, but show up and be present. <laughs> Hey, don't just be like, oh, I'm sorry for you. I'll pray for you. As James says, when we have the ability to meet a need, meet the need beyond just prayer. Prayer, work, and do. That is an empathetic person that shows up in the midst of it and does something about it. Now, here's how the story continues. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went and shut the door behind him and, uh, and the two of them, and he prayed to the Lord. What was his first action? To pray. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself upon him and the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again, walked once back and, the, uh, and forth in the house and he went and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times, which is in the Bible, is a sign of completion. That number means completion. And the child opened his eyes and then summoned uh, Gehazi and said, call the Shumanite. And so he called her, and when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. And he, she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. And she picked up her son and went out. Elisha had sent his staff, and that didn't do the job. So he sent himself. He went himself and replaced the staff. And, and yes, did this weird thing. We talked about this odd thing that Elijah did, the, did last week. Elisha's doing this weird thing. I don't necessarily presume to know the context there, but I can tell you that no one there thought it was weird. We think it's weird because it's weird to us. <laughs> okay, let's just be honest for a second. Yeah, it's weird. But God moved through it. And we'll, we'll get more to this. We're not going to try to say, hey, if you want a miracle... Go home and, and lay on your child and just get him to sneeze seven times, and then a miracle will happen. Well, more, more on that uh, in, in a second. But what Elisha does initially is go to prayer. What he does first is to seek out the will of God. What he does first is to beg upon God. What he does first is say, I'm not going to control the situation. I'm not going to be the one to bring the miracle. God is, and so I will do something, but ultimately it's going to be God working through what is to be done. And so Elisha is desperate in prayer. God moves. There is a miracle. And what does the woman do? Falls prostrate. A sign of worship and a, and a question that we're going to have to ask ourselves and a question that commentaries argue about is, is she worshiping Elisha or is she worshiping the one true God? There is questions behind her worship. But at the end of the day, there was a miracle and there were reactions to the miracle. 
It was uh, six years last, uh, last week that we celebrated. Day one, there was a miracle that took place at Intermediate East. That was holy ground for us as a church because we had spent uh, nine months praying for the birth of this church. We had fasted, we had prayed, uh, we had read books, we had heard all the logic of the day. We took some of the logic and we defied some of the logic. And I remember sitting in the front row, I, I refused to look behind me because I heard all the commotion and I was like, I'm a throw up. And 575 people showed up on day one. 30 people said yes to a relationship with Jesus. It was a crazy day. I remember being in that front row, and Dan Carvalho came up and tapped me on the shoulder and said, looks like your God heard your prayers. I was like, yeah, it sounds like I'm going to throw up if you don't move. (laughs) And so afterwards, I, I get to talk to other church planners. I get to tell them the story of what God did on day one. And you know what human nature is tempted to do? What did you do? I got to do that. Oh, I got to do that. I got to do that. Oh, you gave away free gas? Well, then every church in America, when they start, should start giving out free gas. We start to systematize miracles. No, we can systematize the miracle. Don't do what we did to get a miracle. Pray what we prayed to see a miracle. Fast and pray. Seek the Lord. Seek not wisdom of the day, but seek wisdom of God to flow through whatever you are doing. And so if there is a people in your life that have experienced the miracle of God, great. Praise God for that. Here's what I want to stress to you and I is that my God is big enough to handle any issue in my life. And if I ever start thinking that my God is too small to handle the issue that is before me, then I don't have a great view of God. What you and I need to do, the system that we need to go to when there is a need in front of us is we need to go to a place of prayer. Step one, pray. Step two, trust. Step three, I don't know, follow God and and see how it goes. (laughs) Because God's going to move as you move, and God's going to move even when you're not moving. But ultimately, we're going to God in dependent trust. It is my God who meets the needs of his people, and we do not presume his will through it. So our big thought for us, which is kind of the question that we are left with as this miracle has unfolded, miracles must ignite worship. This whole scene and what we looked at last week, God's bawling out. (laughs) God God is doing these crazy things in the nation of Israel, in the lives of individual people, and and we should be left with this this thing of awe. We should be left with, like, God, like, you're up to something. And this woman falls to her knees, and you and I, even as we would read commentaries, are like, who is she worshiping? She's in awe. Is she worshiping Elisha? Or is she worshiping the one true God? Does she see this as Elisha's miracle or does, she, or does she see this as God through Elisha's miracle? We've been through different sporting events against all odds. Do you ever, you ever be a part of a sporting event or watch a sporting event where kind of this time stands still? You're like, man, like they have defied the odds and like, this is insane. <laughs> I remember Tiger Woods, uh, that chip in for the Masters. It was kind of one of those moments, time stood still. I think it was 2008, uh, I remember sitting in uh, the Bramblewood Apartments in Virginia, and uh, it was trash. But anyways, I was there watching TV and, and just watching LeBron James take over Detroit in the fourth quarter and just make shot after shot. He could not be stopped. And it was like, I commented to be like, man, this is insane. I remember sitting with my dad, not sitting, but standing when David Ortiz walked up to the plate against the Yankees, a regular season game. But he hit a walk-off double off the green monster. Everybody went wild, and we were chanting, Yankees suck on the subway. Uh, Not good for you, but glorious for me. (laughs) But time stood still. I remember the the Super Bowl. We were down 28-3, to and we came back play after play, and time stood still. We do have these sporting events, these moments where it's like, man, the miraculous happened. And do you ever catch, like, the post-game stuff? Sometimes players are quick to give all glory to God. Sometimes they're quick to take glory. Sometimes they're quick to give glory to teammates or to the coaching staff. In those moments after the the miracle that has happened, it tells a lot about what the person sees and how they perceive the situation. Few give glory to God and 
many take glory themselves. And so if you've experienced a miracle, how you respond communicates so much to the people around you. And so this is one of our values is pray for one. One of our values is, is, is praying for people every single day that do not know Jesus. And so there are miracles that are taking place every day in our lives, big and small, but miracles nonetheless. And what you and I do communicates worship to the king or not worship to the king. And so there are days where I was talking to somebody earlier that had a heart surgery and was able to leave the hospital in less than a week. Heart surgery in, in the hospital less than a week. That's commonplace nowadays. But isn't that still a miracle? Aspirin. We might take it for granted, but isn't that a miracle? Landon, you, Ava and I can paint to a point a picture of paint a picture of a miracle that Landon is when we were stressed out when he was born and had to be in the NICU. There are miracles all around us, and when we are quick to give all glory, honor, and praise to the King, perhaps others will start to see all glory and honor and praise going to, king, to the King, and they'll start to see that in their own lives. And so as we think about this, I, I go to a place of actual worship. I know that there's different ways to worship. We, we worship God in obedience. We worship God when we leave here. We worship God when, when somebody cut us off and we didn't get in the car accident. And we just, thank you, God. There's an act of worship there. But there is worship in song. And song has always meant a lot to me. Uh, I've been good places and bad places when it comes to music early on. I was a church kid and didn't know any non-Christian music. And trying to impress a girl one day, I said, my favorite band in ha is Hanson because that's the only secular group I knew. Uh, and if you're laughing because you know Hanson, you know that girl did not give me her number. I looked stupid. Uh, and so music and I have always had a weird relationship. Uh, but the point is, music speaks to us. Music shapes perspective. And so here's my challenge to you and I this week when it comes to the miracles. We live in a, in a secular world, and I know we can put on different playlists and whatnot. I know that you can go uh, into your car right now. You can leave a place like this, and your, the music that you can play can be all sorts of things. Or maybe it's like, hey, I wor my worship playlist, that's my Sunday playlist. Good, great, we'll take it. What about Monday? What about Tuesday? If you struggle for perspective on a Thursday, might it be because you're struggling to fill your head with things of perspective? And so my challenge to you this week, like this woman that we have to question, where, where and what was she worshiping? You listen to many different playlists. How about for one week? One week only. A worship playlist. While you're at the gym, you're like, Jason, I need, I need some pump-up music at the gym. Okay, just give me one week, one week and just try it. See how it impacts your perspective at the gym. Jason, I'm going to work and my job sucks major butt. I don't want to listen to worship music. I need to listen to something that's going to get me through the work day. Okay, okay, just for one week. See how a worship playlist shifts your perspective. And here's why I'm challenging you in this manner. Here's my prayer is that if we are filling our heads with a worship perspective, perhaps we're going to start seeing God more and more in the day-to-day. -day. And if we see God more and more in the day-to-day, -day, perhaps we'll start worshiping more than just in song in our everyday lives. And so would you guys do me a favor? Would you stand and let me just pray over us before we go into one last song? God, in this moment, we are... Um, Father, we are about to join with angels that sing around your throne every moment of every day. Father, as we lift our voice, really not to each other, but to you, Father, would you receive it as worship? Father, would you give us perspective as we sing these songs, Father, as we sing this song, would you 
would you give us one lyric that shapes our thinking about something going on in our lives right now? Father, as we take this challenge, just one week of, of, of just of letting, letting our, the music that we fill ourselves with just be just only worship music. Father, would you help us to see a miracle that we wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have seen because you're, you're shifting our perspective. And Father, in that moment where we pause and where we say thank you, in that moment where we see, man, this wasn't just a happenstance, but the work of God in my life through whatever the situation it might be, Father, would you receive that pause and that thanks as worship? Father, what is the one thing you want from us? Is it not our worship? And so, Father, with joy would we give you our worship in word, in deed, and in song. We love you, Jesus, in your powerful name. Amen. Let's sing.